Awesome. Welcome. Um, what would be great is to just take a couple of minutes and uh, go around and tell us a little bit about your journey here and some of the ways that you've been involved in the education space and uh, what excites you about the future of education. Okay, well, um, my in terms of my journey here today to here, um, uh, Kiwi Connect, my partner works at Kiwi Connect, so that was sort of the beginning, the introductions. I've spent the week here uh, really listening in to what's uh, what's different in each in each group um, each day? There seems to be a slightly different crowd. Um, so my journey here to Education Day today at Kiwi Connect um, has kind of been like a build up of sort of checking out each day and seeing how they vary in the crowds as much as anything has been interesting. Um, in terms of my journey for like with education and my passion, I've come from having um, second chance learning and community empowerment and education as things that are intertwined. Um, I come from a family of ex high school teachers who uh, really got frustrated with seeing systematic failure happening in, in low socioeconomic communities, especially with Pacific communities. Um, and so I was born into a family that had a very strong social justice bent and on the, um, the role of education to, um, to create change and, and equality um, of opportunities. So my education background is very much in uh, working with at-risk and low literacy um, learners, adults and youth, um, Māori and Pacific communities, and being very employment and employability focused uh, there are many other reasons to, to, to talk about education, but the employment and employability, economic empowerment opportunities is, is where my passion really lies with education. All right, thank you. Kia ora, my name's Sylvia. Um, and I was thinking, I guess it's always in these introducing ways, is there's so many different hats and lenses that you can bring to a conversation. Um, so I thought I'd just touch on a couple ones. Um, the very first one is I'm a Wellingtonian, and so I thought I'd just sort of touch to Wellington and welcome all of you who have come from overseas and from outside of Wellington. Um, I grew up in Wellington. And I guess, though, then the other one that I want to introduce myself as on the stage is as a daughter. And it's really nice to be on the stage with my mother. And it's also really nice to be sitting next to um, Brian and Matthew's mum. So it's really nice to think of family as an introduction here as well. Because I think when we're talking about education, I think, you know, you, you get your first education from your family. Um, I think the, the next lens that I want to bring is I'm very actively engaged with the Inspiral Network. And I think that's a core lens that I currently bring to a lot of my work. Um, I think one of the questions we're asking at Inspiral is how does Inspiral do education, what, what are the core principles that we hold to that, and what is the core sort of impulse behind the education system that we're trying to create through the Inspiral lens. Um, and I guess the fourth sort of primary one that I would bring is through the lens of Chalkal. Um, Chalkal is the startup that I'm working with with a crew out of um, Inspiral. And Chalkal on a very base level is really looking at the foundational infrastructure on how we can rewire the adult education system. So what we're looking at there is going, let's move the education system from an industrialised, batched, productised system into a human-centric, empowered system. And um, I can talk further on what that actually means on a real practical level with Chalkal, but that's my core work at the moment. But I guess fundamentally what I really want to introduce myself as, as someone who sees education as the acupuncture point that I can use to make real systemic social change. If there's so many problems out there, and I'm drawn to so many of them, food, tech, you know, politics, it's, it's, there's so many things I want to do, but there's a limited number of hours I have. And I kind of made the assessment that actually, if I'm going to focus all of my energy, where do I want it to focus? And I've decided on the education system because it's empowering human beings and enabling them to realize that the discovery of finding their own real potential is actually going to then mean that people can go out and change those systems themselves. So that's where I focus my, um, my work at the moment. Hi everybody, I'm Denise, and as she mentioned, I'm mother of Matthew and Brian, so that's where my journey began. I think that's why I got a spot up here, too. <laughs> uh, 
My, I'm coming more from a background as just your traditional public school teacher. I taught for a long time in Illinois. I taught middle school, language arts and history. Uh, I grew up in Chicago and everyone in my family, my mother, grandmother, all her brothers and sisters were all Chicago public school teachers. So they were on strike. This was the days of uh, allowing people who had individuals with disability acts, all, all those fundamental changes that happened in the 60s around public education. So I, that's the perspective I come from. And now that I've moved from Illinois to California, I'm seeing a totally different side of public education and all the cool innovative proje projects that are happening in places like California. And it's, it's exciting and in inspiring although I still kind of look at uh, issues of inequity and uh, neighborhood, the way that we fund public education and things like that, and who, who really is getting access to some of the really good stuff with the high tuition costs. So uh, that's, but it is, there is room for me to be excited even in the public schools. I've been working uh, the last year in a school that's located in Silicon Valley, but it's a lower SES school. So they do get the benefits of lots of resources, grants from Facebook, things like that. Uh, so it's not resources, it's, it's uh, what are we gonna do with the resources in the most effective way. So th thank you. Thank you. My name is Doris and I've landed on this spot through my connection with Sylvia. <laughs> she gets me into all these exciting spaces. Thank you for inviting me, Joseph. Um, I've grown up in Switzerland and had my formal education there until I was 22, coming to New Zealand. My um, qualification is science, but my profession has been in education. I've been involved with um, Waldorf Education, having um, founded a school 25 years ago and um, watched its development, um, focused on young children from kindergarten to 13, um, focusing on the actual unfolding of the child in a balanced way, in an unhurried, balanced way, drawing out, not so much popping in, and watching for the balance of academic, artistic, and practical, truly experiential, experiential learning. I'm now witnessing all our pioneer children in their 20s, and I've witnessed my three daughters going through their schooling and in their 20s. My key interest and passion now is watching the questions of young people leaving school. I hear questions, what do I need to learn to get prepared for this fast changing world? I watch and observe them with a sense of receiving a sense of pressure. Young people are asked who you want to be, what are you going to do, what are you going to study? They're experiencing this pressure while they're feeling a sense of disconnect and actually are dealing with the question, who am I? Where do I belong to? How can I serve in this world? What is my contribution? The core human question. I'm interested of how do we deal with these softer values of education, the hard, the, the, the technical knowledge aspect of information is so well taken care of. Technology made it accessible online, it's marvellous. We can now focus on the complementary aspect of education, responding to those key questions. And I'm excited with my involvement with Orientation Aotearoa, which I feel responds to those questions, providing a space for young people residentially one year to explore that very core human question. Who am I and what do I need to learn to contribute meaningfully? Um, so my fir first question to all of you is, uh, Sylvie so brought up human-centric uh, uh, learning. And there's this concept of being playing around of community-oriented learning and, and education. I'm curious to hear, what does that really mean? How should we start to understand such a way of approaching education? I guess when the way that I understand it is going 
every single individual is unique. We say that, right? But what I'm interested in then, why do we then create infrastructure, educational infrastructure, that doesn't allow people to actually uniquely find the path that they want to follow? So on a real practical level, you can think about this in primary school and, you know, you, you group kids by their age and if you're nine, you're nine and you go there. Well, but where are all the different talents and, and unique elements of um, a child? I think, though, what might be really important as a frame setting for this panel is to recognise that primary education and adult education are quite different. So creating a primary education that's human-centric will be looking at who is this individuality in front of me as a growing child that's finding their own personality, whereas in an adult, you're actually perhaps more trying to more empower them and figure out how they want to find their task in the world. So I guess then for my personal lens where I'm looking at it with Chalkal, what we're asking the question is going, okay, yes, there's all of this information out there. Yes, there's all these people. But how actually do you discover and learn the real practical skills that I need right now? And why is it that so often the educational institutions are batch teaching you know, ma media marketing managing, you know, something, which is really important, but at the same time, when things are changing so fast, what you learn at the beginning of your degree may, lo no, may no longer be relevant when you come out after three years. So what we're trying to do with Chalkal is find the people in your community that actually have the skills that you need right now, and how do we connect them on a hu on a human-to-human -human level? Part of the difficulty, I think, is is the as Catlin brought up. You know, it'd be nice if somebody had a product at the end of the year. I do see a lot of classrooms moving to a portfolio type basis for mm -hmm. for grading or assessing, but it's really hard to measure a large number of students on their soft skills. Mm -hmm. So we we just do testing and more testing. <laughs> We're greatly challenged at the moment with our initiative. You know, every funding application asks you for outcomes, and we feel we're creating a platform that's beyond measurable outcomes. And to me, it's like, I love what you said, um, the difference of the child and the adult. In the adult, you really want to go, um, you want to nurture the, the curiosity for learning, just like the child, but you actually want to instill the capacities, it's no longer just knowledge, it's the capacities of problem solving and creativity that makes you able to respond to this incredible fast changing world. The knowledge is yes, the skill that you will need then, but the resilience, the creativity and the imagination to forever imagine something new because the present is not necessarily at times working. <coughs> This doesn't answer your question so much as where it has gone to. Um, so uh, I'm doing a, a, another hat. I've, I'm doing a PhD right now and looking at um, evaluating what different um, programs work to support uh, youth transitions from education to employment and how to develop employability. Um, and soft skills has been coming up every single day <laughs> this week. Um, and I was just, just talking at, um, at, at morning tea about soft skills and that word... That, that term triggers so many different interpretations. Uh, I think one thing that we really need to do in education, in, not just in education, in, in our society, is get a clearer set of terms that we, so that we understand, we're not talking past each other about what it is that we're trying to achieve for outcomes. Because um, on, you know, on the day focused on entrepreneurs, there was lots of demand for soft skills and how important it is to have soft skills. Um, and in, in, uh, in employer circles, you talk about soft skills and every, you know, employer surveys say that's one of the top things they value, above qualifications a lot of the time. Um, then you go into the education sector and people have, again, multiple different definitions of what that does and doesn't mean and whether it's a cabbage subject and it's only for people who aren't academics. Um, so we need a clearer definition so that we can all agree what it is that we, we want to achieve as outcomes uh, from education mm -hmm. and especially around that area of soft skills. Um, personally, I, and it's something I'm arguing in, in my thesis, 
Soft skills are very hard to measure, not impossible, okay? Our, our formal education systems are focused on standardized ways of measuring things, okay? They need to standardize things because it's public money and the expectation is that you can say how many widgets you produced it, you know, that can do this X, Y, and Z in a standardized assessment way. But if you think about a CV as um, representing the different things that em not just employers value, but other people in the community, like a CV for a volunteer role, okay? Qualifications is one section on the CV, and that's um, a way of, qualifications is a standardized way of signaling to employers and different people that you've got often technical or hard skills, okay? And it might imply some other things too. Um, but soft skills, if you think about referees and um, the, how much weight people place on referees, or seeing what else you've done where you might have demonstrated your soft skills, I think it is possible for us to talk about ways that we can develop um, uh, validation signaling um, so that we're, we're actually creating validation systems, as you kind of do on something like LinkedIn, okay, when you endorse people. Um, maybe we could talk more about that uh, between both education you know, groups but and employer groups as well. Mm. So sorry, that's not your question. That's where they were going. <laughs> It's actually this that's very relevant and when we think about um many of the soft skills like um uh about last year there was a, a research that was done across technology employers around new zealand and what are some of the most important things that they're all looking for and they say this is soft skills leadership communication ability to work with one another as the most important even beyond academic qualifications um so i'm actually curious to hear if anyone in this group has had any experience with ways of uh, measuring uh, and, and tracking the development and work of soft skills rather than just um, transfer of information through classroom activities. There is um, oh, an intersection I saw recently called the Classroom Dojo and it's this online platform where teachers have like everyone in the class's names listed, and it's sort of a, a behavioral response sheet, so people can be sort of given feedback easily. A teacher can go in and in 15 minutes give some feedback to everyone's behavior from throughout the day, or I saw you being very helpful with this, or I saw this, and sort of just this reinforcement so that the parents can know what was going on behaviorally throughout the day and also reward that or provide feedback. So that's this very easy way that tech is kind of trying to bring some more attention to that area, so I thought that was relevant to share. Uh, so we've at, at Dev Academy, we focus a lot on soft skills and training it, and so there's lots of curriculum and things you can do, but the question about how to measure it and how to track it, the only solution we've got so far is really high touch and sort of teacher time so that we sort of have like a one to five teacher ratio, so that when people progress through, there isn't a formal test or anything, but there is a big amount of the teacher's judgment and a recommendation about what do you need to work on, where do you need to go. So that's based off spending lots of time with the students and having a, a, a very non-standardized recommendation or assessment at the end of it would be how we're doing it. Can I jump straight to that because I think that links to a really interesting question about the um, online offline education and you know with with all the different online education things at the moment like Coursera and Udacity and all of these different ones what they're making education more accessible granted but if you look at the drop off rates it's incredible you know you start with 20,000 people and the people that actually finish it you might end up with 500 so I think that's an interesting stat, but I guess I would ask this just as an open question. If soft skills are so important, can you measure soft skills online? And I really like what Josh is saying because I would perhaps use that as an argument to say, no, you can't, and therefore, is that the value of face-to-face -face education? And perhaps to then ask the next you know, provocative question of, do we need face-to-face -face education? You know, why, why should we all be in a room together? What is the actual value? when actually you can you know, teach 5,000 people online. And I definitely think you have to be face-to-face, -face, but I can see that's what you also think, so. 
I think face-to-face -face response, the core human um, character we have. We are social beings. We're not just curious, we are social. And so it's not just who am I, it's the curiosity, who are you? And there's a limit of how I can figure that one out online. <laughs> but I'd love to ask another question around the soft skill before we get into measuring them. Can we explore a little bit more, you know, how, how do we develop soft skills? And but anyway, maybe we're not quite yeah. answered that question. May I ask that question? Yes. May I answer it? <laughs> 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 In our fast world, um, my belief is that some of the key soft skills you can't just pop in overnight. They take space and time and experience and encounter with each other and, and my actions and the response from the world, my action, but that pause spot, that pause button of reflection, sometimes slow, can really create the soft skill and I just want to challenge our fast world. You know, we, we are fighting for this a year of space, giving young people space, take the pressure off, and give time to truly explore. And I believe that is what develops the soft yeah. skills such as compassion, a sense of morality, um, and all the other skills that we yeah. are after as employers. And, and we have to remember that the majority of that does not come during the school day. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember in a teacher education program uh, class, it said, you can get the kid, and I'm, I'm mostly in, you know, 32 to 1 ratios. Uh, you could get the kid if you have at least three to five minutes of eye contact throughout the day with that individual. So trying to keep track of, like, did I look at Johnny yet? You know, or, or recognize him for his inherent worth in the room. So it does not, it, we can't rely only on the schools to do that. The soft skills have to be developed in the home, in the community, in the extracurricular programs. I just yeah. want to point that out. And that's my next question is, when we talk about a holistic model of education, what is the role of uh, formal education? What is the role that parents play and what is the role that communities around us play um, in, in providing a more holistic uh, educational experience for our children. Perhaps I'll just jump in there on a real personal note, is it's been really interesting with an Inspiral how many people say they're still recovering from their primary school. And, you know, I know, and I think Rich will let me share that, but Rich from Lumio described how he's, he went through, you know, 15 years of primary and high school education and it's taken him 15 years to recover from that you know in terms of the bullying in terms of the you know the structure and me personally I never had that experience I loved my education and I thrived in it and I think that was part of that feeling of actually what's going on in there what why are these people not not yeah, thriving in their education system and how can I try and help people have more of the experiences that I had. But I guess that's just from a personal response. I, can, I guess um, in terms of holistic education or um, be, and that sort of overlaps with the student-centred learning mm. discussion, um, I find that often you've got um, community groups who naturally do learn holistically and as communities together. Um, and maybe we could tap into that a bit more um, because especially with disadvantaged communities in, in the New Zealand context. So we ran some really awesome um, uh, community learning uh, hubs in um, Samoan churches in, around the Hutt Valley. Mm -hmm. And they came in and they talked about themselves being a learning village and they were just natural at holistic learning. We didn't have to, you know, introduce them to this new thing called holistic learning. It was just, they just, um, it was holistic in um, what they thought was worth learning. So we, we did some digital literacy introduction to the computer, and then we did some um, cooking together, and we, talk, we integrated numeracy and literacy into that. We talked about um, goal setting and, and, and life goals, um, and, how to be able to plan plan goals that are baby steps into you know um, plan and review 
your progress and actively learn how to do that in a holistic way, not just get my qualification, but also I want to get my driver's license or I want to learn to cook three new recipes, mm. um, you know, through these community group learning sessions. Mm. Um, but anyway, I think holistic learning and community learning often go together very naturally as a combination. Um, and maybe we could actually look at some of those um, informal learning setups that happen naturally in tight-knit communities, like often it is around a church group or something like that, um, observe what is working and why that way, and then see if we can somehow replicate that in our more formal systems, mm. rather than go the other way, because actually they've got a lot of answers there already. Mm. I wonder, um, oh, I'm just going to... I'm in the middle, so I'm going to grab the mic. <laughs> I just want to ask the quick question of, um, I heard both of you say families, school structures and communities. I'm really interested in what's the role of business and how do we get, if we're talking about real world education, why is it that you spend 20 years not interacting with business and then suddenly the next 20 years, whether starting a business or working in a business, and why isn't there that connection? And you know, what are the different... With Chalkle right now, we're trying to see if we can partner with one of the biggest tech companies in Wellington to create alternative forms of professional development where we connect their staff with young people and their impulses around youth employment. And they're saying, we're a tech company and there's no young people to be able to hire and they're not seeing tech as an alternative career option. So what we're saying is Chalkle is saying, well, actually, you have all the skills. You have some of the best IT professionals in your company. How do we help you connect them to the young people so that then it becomes, you're starting to reduce the barriers that way? So when I would be talking about a holistic societal education, I'd be interested in the role of family, community, institutions, and businesses. Uh, yeah, one other point I want to make about community schools is also uh, the need to be careful not to uh, have the schools segregated then. Because community in a, in a big city usually employ, uh, the way they're arranged is ethnically. So like, for example, in a Hispanic neighborhood, you come out and all the smells of all the, you know, the food carts and, and it, it, colorful murals and, and they walk to school and it's, it's beautiful expression of community. So, but we also have to make sure that they also get included in the global uh, connection. My view on holistic education is it's all of the above, you know, all what you've listed, and you forever look for the balance. Um, so when we say a, you, you've got a prodigy child in front of you that's a genius at, in, in math, you celebrate that, but a holistic approach would be to also look, oh, what else is missing? You know, do, you don't want an, an hyperactive or an antisocial um, math genius. You want an all-rounded mass genius that's also good at growing your own potatoes. Um, you just forever look for the balance. And for me, that's holistic education. It's really balancing all aspects, online, formal, experiential, hands-on education, all have got its place. And I guess just sometimes where I feel we've gone out of balance, mm. that it's formal, online, and the face-to-face -face experiential is is a little bit at risk. Hmm. We touched upon this in, in the conversation so far, the topic of inequality. Um, how do we overcome inequality in education? What are some thoughts that you have around that and also any models that you've seen that we can learn from? Just real briefly, I think one of the main ways we could reduce inequality is to uh, help, help minority groups become teachers. Uh, you walk into schools and it's still all white females, um, you know, other than the, like the secretaries and stuff. So if they, if children see more role models of their own kind and also a total restructure of the whole way we finance public education. So could you take care of that, Yoso? <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> um, I spent some time in Benin, West Africa, teaching in a small school there. And it was interesting because I came in having gone through a Steiner Waldorf school and going, I'm going to bring, you know, holistic education to these children and I'm going to teach them how to knit. And I realised within the first two days that actually it was the foundational structure that we needed to try and support the teachers with. These were classrooms with 50 kids. And when you walked in, there's a whip on the table. So any time I went near the whip, all of the kids cowered. And that was when I realised that actually, no, not knitting, 
but actually how do you empower the teachers that were standing at the front? They needed a whip because they had 50 unruly kids because the parents sent them there and they'd never had really proper any interaction in the past. So I guess I bring that as a story of going, there's so many different layers to education and if we talk about inequality, I can go in as a white, well-educated woman into West Africa and try and teach kids to knit, but actually when I leave, they don't have knitting needs and needles and wool, so it's useless. But therefore, I can go in and I can have conversations with the teachers and go, actually, how can I help you as an individual and start with the individual teachers and through that way then be able to create the systemic change? And I guess that was just my yeah, frustration at the inequality that I was experiencing there. I actually have, and I'm saying this as currently an academic, <laughs> you know, focused on qualifications um, in the form formal systems. I have, in some ways, more confidence and hope in the private sector and in groups like those gathering together at Kiwi Connect who are entrepreneurs. Um, I have more confidence that there will be um, groundbreaking relationships that can happen between entrepreneur communities and the business community um, to do more things like supporting Michelle's OMG type setups, um, to really tap into disadvantaged communities and give them access to education that is holistic focused, but I, you know, I've got my employability hat on, is also employment focused and self-employment focused as, as part of it, right? Um, I have more confidence that that can happen faster with greater impact than relying on the public sector and public um, public education systems to be able to do the same thing as fast because there's more restrictions on the public sector than there is on these communities that have been gathering here to directly go in and have partnerships with schools and communities. It's, it's a much faster and more likely thing to, to happen. So. As a member of that community, yo, where you go? Cool. <laughs> uh, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience or any reflections that you might have. Thank you all for being here. Look at all the women on the stage. Um, so one thing I just wanted to add into the space as a reflection in addition to the, um, it ties into the soft skills and it ties into the community driven approach is um, one way to, to kind of break down a format of experiential education is by um, things that students care about. So, and so the work that I've done is a lot around, I call it like a social change boot camp for teens. Um, but you take issues that affect them and you let them throw that out there on the board of like, so it could be environmental issues, it could be gang violence, it could be sexual abuse and sexual assault, it can be bullying, all these things that have affected them since they were young. And then you can do this in a whole school, you can do this in a community group, you can do this really anywhere with young people. Um, and then what it does is it inherently creates a safe space for students to be vulnerable because they're aligned based on certain things that they care about that have affected them. So it has them be more engaged. And then from that place you have their attention, their attention span grows so much more. And then there's so much of, a, um, you can use a multidisciplinary or multiple intelligences approach to be able to teach them multiple different things because you have them aligned in a group, in a community of people that care about addressing the same things. And you also start teaching them problem solving and help shift them from a place of feeling powerless, which may not be so applicable when they're in early elementary school, but as they get older, they start to feel like, who am I, you know, who am I in the world? Um, what do I have to offer? And you start to help them shift into a place of feeling powerful, like, I don't have to be 18 to vote to affect, to be more compassionate and kind to the kids in my class. Um, so it's, a, it's just kind of an interesting way um, to section out learning in an experiential way that helps them be rallying because a certain thing is has something that um, is something that's affected them deeply in their heart. So it's very like behavioral, heart to heart, human to human, um, which gives them more space to receive other types of skills. So just. Uh, there are the reflections over here, Adam. Uh, 
I just had a quick thought about something here. There's a, a question earlier about how to recognize soft skills. And um, that's something that I tried to figure out for myself. And for a long time, um, I, I was listening to what other people were telling me I was good at, but I wasn't thinking about, you know, what, what, I, what am I really spending my time on? What, what are my skills deeply? And so I, um, I eventually kind of started to think about, you know, what, what do I always do when, um, when I don't have to do anything else? Like when I'm bored. And I started to list those things out, and there, there were patterns to that. And, uh, and I found out that, that actually, like, what I, the, the things that, I'm, that I really enjoy doing deeply and I'm actually better at are the things that I do when I'm bored. And I think that um, it's important for kids to, to, to be bored at certain times. And I think for, you know, for their learning, it should be structured, but also unstructured. They need unstructured time. And that's something that um, a lot of kids don't get these days. So just wanted to add that. Um, I'd like to really just support Doris's insights, um, which to me are absolutely crucial. I've been involved for quite some time now with um, US-based tertiary students doing experiential education in various parts of the planet and some pretty wild places um, up in the Himalayas and Native American communities and, and, and Zapatista communities. Um, and the focus of that particular program, apart from an underlying theme of how do we shift perception, shift awareness, um, is to follow curiosity, um, establish learning communities, um, look at all these gifts and how they can be challenged. And, and more and more, we, we have to grade to a certain extent to satisfy host communities, school communities back in the States. But outcomes, I think, are totally overstressed. Um, grading is totally overstressed. Um, how do these kids ask better questions? How do they see the connections? Um, what is their shift in awareness? How do they, they cope with silence? Um, the power of ritual, where you can actually open your heart to see and feel more clearly. Um, those can be expressed in all sorts of ways. You know, we get our kids to do some stunning academic work, but we also get them to be incredibly creative. Um, and of course, you can't grade creativity. You've got to give them 10 out of 10. Um, but the all-roundedness, I think, is at what, at what really is the key element. And I think our, our ultimate test would be that if they haven't shifted their perception and awareness and to see connections, we've failed. There's a wonderful um, phrase that says, you know, we, we grow in the direction of the questions we ask. Mm -hmm. And I would put on top of that, um, how do we create an education system that empowers our young kids to ask non googleable questions? Because so much is around, you know, I, I am just someone that I'm constantly asking questions. And often I will ask a hypothetical question that I'm living into, and the very first response is, oh, hang on, I'll just go check that. And I'm like, no, 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 let's just, let's just explore it and live into it and through that see if we can collectively discover it. So those are just two, two directions that I, I really hear what you're saying. I, re I really like that hook. Sorry to just jump in there, but you know, throughout this discussion I've been thinking uh, you know, around what Doris was saying, around uh, that if we are going to have holistic education, we need the families, the, the formal education, the communities, all surrounding um, this child and young person or adult in their journey and I'm thinking whose responsibility is it to look at all of these gaps and how are we going to ensure that that happens for every um, person that is, is part of the education system and maybe um, what you're saying Sylvie as far as uh, encouraging people to ask the right questions might cover some of that I don't know what your thoughts are on that I so strongly echo with all these responses. Um, I got two reflections. Um, yes, the curiosity, that's one thing. But I strongly echo, was it Adam? Well, yeah. Um, the boredom, yes. <laughs> it's creating again that gap. And it's the opposite of overfilling. If, if we feel the task of education is lighting the fire, really um, finding your passion, your interest. It needs a moment for that to come out. If you keep overfilling, if you keep the children forever, you know, one program after the next structured, there is no space for something to grow that's truly your own unique passion. And, and that needs to happen again as an adult. You know, find yourself, give yourself the space of exploring what's next. And that's what I feel a 21-year-old needs, but it's actually all of us deserve that at some stage in our lives. 
I had the privilege of finishing my job two years ago. Everyone asked me, what are you going to do next? I felt like a 21-year-old. And I took a year just to, to, to wander the world. My answer was, just give me a moment. And that moment, I want to give to a 21-year-old to that the true fire comes out, and then that fire can get trained and, and formally educated. And if you're on fire, you are employable. Uh, a quick comment to make on that. When we talk about curiosity, one of the best gifts that I've received was um, uh, the way my parents taught me uh, as I grew up is when I ask a question, they respond back with a question. And that really actually allowed me to ask and, and wonder and explore. And when we think about education, um, oftentimes we think about um, teachers being the sources of information and you're withdrawing information from them. I don't know if you've heard of uh, philosopher Paulo Freire from Brazil. Uh, he coined the term of um, a banking system of education, which is uh, throughout the year, the teacher is, um, uh, the student is withdrawing information from the teacher, You're basically depositing it and then, and then the teacher then withdraws that during an exam. So it's just transferring information. And one of the themes that has come up over the last few days is just the exponential rate of change in everything that we're doing. We're creating so much information where everything is just becoming obsolete and evolving over time. And so moving education from an information-based economy to a knowledge-based economy, knowledge being uh, something that's co-created and it's actively evolving, and that's a very much a pedagogical approach to learning where we have discourse and, and discussions and conversations uh, rather than working towards a very specific outcome. Uh, we're in the space of creativity using all the resources that are available to us. Just add some. Yeah. Two, two quotes that I, that I love. Um, one is, I can't remember who said it, but Google it. <laughs> <laughs> that we are, we are now, we're drowning in information and starving for knowledge. And that's, that's true, and it ties into what Doris has, has been going, uh, you know, talking about. And the, the, <laughs> the other thing is that paralyzing question we keep asking school leavers and teenagers, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's paralyzing to realize, you know, I've got to make a decision and commit forever. Can we please at least change that to what do you want to be next? Because it will be many things. Yeah, or even asking him a soft skill question, like, what do you want to be like? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to respond to the ungoogable question. Um, does it take away the wonder? And do we celebrate the sacred? You know, everything is Googleable. And is it, is it healthy to sometimes live in wonder and not being able to explain everything and be quite comfortable in that question? and just follow the quest of questions and be comfortable in it. Because I, I think I want to jump off to that and bring it practical in terms of what, for example, some of us are trying to do with Inspiral. You know, if, if we take in it, and I think many of us are here right now because the current bar paradigm of society, there's many things that we might all personally believe is wrong, but how we're trying to shift that into the future, none of us know, and if, we want to wonder about the future and recreate it in the imagination of what it could be. We can't Google what the future is going to look like. So if we're creating an education system, and I guess this was always what frustrated me the most about of my university time, was writing papers, coming up with crazy ideas, and my lecturer is saying, where's the reference? And I'd say, well, I don't know, because I made it up. And they're like, no, 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 you can't have that in your research paper because it needs to be a reference of the past. But if you're trying to create a new future, you know, if with Chalko we're trying to create a new education system, with Inspiral we're trying to create new businesses, there is no reference to the past of how you create a decentralised organisation or whatever it is that you're trying to do. So where do we create that wonder which then so tangibly comes out in my work and in many of our works as we're trying to create organisations and businesses that are trying to feed the future? Mm. Um, one, one last question. Yes. Oh, sorry. 
Yosef's assistant here. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to kind of tie in a few things that we've kind of been discussing throughout our time here over the last five days. And um, this idea of creating wonder is something that I've been thinking a lot about. And um, a research group out of Berkeley University is doing a study right now on awe. And so I had an opportunity to hear them speak about this on Facebook's campus. Actually, they pulled all these leaders together. And this was for the Wisdom 2.0 event last year, and they're talking about how awe, the response of awe in the body actually decreases inflammation response. So in that space where the body is not in an inflamed position, you actually are able to learn. You're actually able to take in information. And so thinking about that in terms of how do we create awe with the natural world and allow people the space to explore and, and then this connection through food. Another member of our conversation said that the, the in entry point into caring about the natural world is so often through food. And so we have all of these conversations we've been talking about for the whole week and we bring this food and this awe and this wonder and this spaciousness and all of a sudden there's, there's nutrients in the body, the epigenetic epigenetics are in alignment to actually take in the information. So I think just pulling all of those together and just so happy that this conversation is here on a farm surrounded by food where we get to taste the food in a few minutes for lunch. So. Uh, we're just about to go. We're a bit late for lunch, but we'd love to thank you all for the time that uh, you've made and uh, really appreciate the conversations on uh, holistic and community-oriented education. Thank you very much. Thank you.